beginning in verse 22. So far in our study of Luke, we have seen Jesus command evil spirits to leave the bodies of people who were demon-possessed. He has ordered a fever to leave Peter's mother-in-law. He has healed a man of leprosy. He has healed a paralytic and forgiven him of his sins. He has raised the widow's dead son. He has performed countless other uh, miracles that are not individually just described, but generally uh, stated that he performed many, many miracles. And multitudes of people were coming to Jesus because of his words and his miracles. And in this passage today, Jesus saves the lives of his followers by calming a storm that was about to sink their boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. So we read in verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. According to the parallel passage in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, uh, this certain day was at the end of the same day in which huge multitudes of people from many towns and cities had been crowding around Jesus. Because of his popularity, uh, many of the religious leaders were uh, jealous, uh, were opposed to his teaching, were publicly accusing him of performing his miracles by the power of Beelzebub, Satan, especially after he had cast a demon out of a blind man uh, who was also mute, so that once the demon was gone, the man could see and speak. And we read that account in the parallel gospel account in Matthew chapter 12. Verse 22. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all give us information about this event that we are looking at today. Jesus had rebuked the religious leaders, warning them that to blaspheme the Holy Spirit was uh, like that was to commit an unpardonable sin. And then in response to their unbelief, Jesus began teaching in parables so that uh, those who believed could understand, but those who did not believe could not understand. And it was a day of intense uh, ministry, intense spiritual opposition, confrontation with ungodly spiritual leaders. And at the end of the day, according to Mark 4.35, when evening had come, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and set out to cross over to the other shore uh, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It would have been about a 10-kilometer journey across the water. Here we see an example of how to make disciples. It involves doing things together, traveling together, spending lots of time together. They all got into the boat together, and they were sharing in this experience. Whether you are discipling your own children at home or discipling your neighbor uh, or co-worker, um, spending quality time doing things together will result in having quantity, or spending quantity time rather together doing things will result in quality time. Many times, particularly as parents, you want to have quality time, but you try and schedule quality time without investing quantity. Uh, You cannot schedule quality time. You schedule quantity time, and quality things happen mixed in there. And you never know when it's going to happen, but it comes. And so quality time is a byproduct of spending quantity time together and Jesus spent quantity time with his disciples they did everything together and these kinds of experiences just happen the kind we're reading about here today in the middle of sharing together in common life experiences you have occasional amazing teaching opportunities Now, this is a historic account of an event that actually happened. But it is also loaded with spiritual symbolism that gives us lots of practical application for our own lives. So we're going to look at the historical account and the application to our own lives. And you don't have to physically get into a boat and go out to sea to be able to apply this to our lives. According to Charles Spurgeon, uh, the boat 
in this record is a strong symbol of the Christian life. It is a tremendous illustration, he says, of Christ dwelling in his church. The disciples got into the boat and Jesus got in with them and they embarked out onto the sea. And he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. Jesus spoke words of direction and words of intent. What was his intent? We're going to go to the other side of the lake. He did not say we're going to go halfway across. He didn't say we're going to go to the bottom of the lake. He said we're going to go to the other side of the lake. If Jesus said they were going to cross over to the other side of the lake, it was because the Father had communicated to Jesus that this was his will. This was the direction that he was giving him, to cross over. Therefore, if God says you are to go somewhere, he will ensure that it happens. The Lord never says that, uh, says things that don't come true. And so they launched out onto the sea, and all was going well at first. As the sky grew darker, because it was night, they could likely see the lights of the cities on the different shore across the, across the water and uh, point the bow of their boat on one of these light points and um, sail to, in the gentle breeze across the lake to the other side. The first hour or so likely passed uneventfully as they quietly sailed uh, out into the middle of the sea. In verse 23, but as they sailed, he, that's Jesus, fell asleep. Here we see the humanity of Christ. The Bible makes it clear that God does not sleep. Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So God does not sleep. But Jesus, when he came to earth and became a man, though he never ceased to be God, he limited his ability, he limited himself to living within the limitations and weaknesses of a man. And as a man, after a long day of ministry, a long day of confronting the spiritual opposition and the pressure of the opposition of the Jewish leaders, he was exhausted and he slept. Verse 23, but as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. Suddenly, as the the wind rose, uh, a squall swept without warning out of the, uh, the mountains and came upon the lake, and Peter may have pulled up the sail, pulled in the sail to ride out the storm. Perhaps John was... Uh, at the tiller, exerting extra strength on the rudder. And this wasn't a new thing for them. They've seen many storms. They'd been out on the sea through many storms. And you can imagine that the experienced fishermen in the boat may have amused themselves at the, the sight of the panic, the slight panic, perhaps initially in the landlubbers who were on board, like Matthew, the tax collector, uh, Simon the zealot, Judas Iscariot, A sudden violent squall was common on the Sea of Galilee, as gusts of cold air still to this day will rush down out of the mountains and stir up uh, the the sea. The fishermen uh, weren't concerned at first. However, it wasn't long that even the fishermen on board began to be gripped with fear. They had never experienced a storm quite this fierce before. The sea raged and the ship began to toss like a cork while wave after growing wave broke over the boat and began filling the boat. As fast as they all bailed, the water rose faster and they soon realized that they were about to sink. It was only a matter of time. The storm showed no sign of letting up. The wind blew with an evil ferocity that uh, seemed intent on destroying them. In fact, when you read in the next verse how Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, the Greek text 
for him rebuking the wind and waves uses the same terminology as when Jesus rebuked evil spirits. The implication here is that somehow evil spirits were involved in this great storm, either to cause the storm itself or to intensify the impact of a normal storm upon the boat filled with Jesus and his disciples. Can demons cause a windstorm? Look with me to the book of Job, the first chapter of Job. Job chapter 1. And uh, let's look at verse 8. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Verse 11. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to his, your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And look down at verse 19. A report comes in. Suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on Job's children, killing all of them. The clear implication of that passage is that either Satan had caused this great wind, or at the very least, he had caused the house to fall down in a normal great wind. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 uh, reveals that there's coming a time in the future where God's going to send four angels to prevent any wind from blowing upon the earth. Um, so it would seem that angelic powers, demonic powers, demons or fallen angels are capable of having some manipulation upon the climate. Now it's at night, in the middle of the lake, Jesus is sleeping. My personal experience, uh, spiritual attacks often strike in the middle of the night, waking me up, often in a sweat, filled with fear or anxiety, and they can sometimes last for hours. When these middle-of-the-night attacks come, the Lord has begun teaching me to get up out of bed and pray. And this always turns the attack into an opportunity for victory and blessing and has often resulted in some of my richest times of prayer. It is interesting to note that at their destination, they're, they're heading across the, the lake. And if you read ahead in Luke chapter 8, you discover that uh, at their destination there was a demonic stronghold. And it seems, as you read ahead in the chapter, that Jesus had only one purpose for going across this lake. He accomplishes that purpose, and he returns. And his one purpose was to confront that legion of demons, that stronghold of demons. And then he returns. It would seem that perhaps the demonic realm saw Jesus coming, and sought to destroy him, or at least to keep him from fulfilling his mission as he approached this destination. In the scripture, the sea is sometimes representative of the nations of the world. For example, in some of Daniel's visions, Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, for example, um, Using the disciples and Christ in the boat as an illustration of the church, you see... And this is application. This is a historical event. It actually happened. But through this event, God is illustrating some things. You have the church gone out into the sea for the purpose of bringing the gospel to those in spiritual bondage and setting the captives free. As the sea is stirred up by the powers of hell to try and destroy them, or at least to prevent them from accomplishing their mission, so we, as followers of Christ, have been sent into all the world with the gospel. We have been sent, as Jesus said, as sheep among wolves. 
There will always be storms of opposition. There will always be attacks against the church of Christ. For the Christian who seeks to take Christ to the lost will be opposed. There will always be danger. But let us never forget that Jesus is always present with us in our boat. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 to you from the Amplified Bible. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Hebrews 13, verse 5, For for he, that is God himself, has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you, assuredly not. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. Jesus is always with you in your boat. No matter what the boat is going through, Jesus is with you in the boat. Jesus was right there with them in the boat. But what a contrast between the way the storm was affecting Jesus in the boat and the way it was affecting the disciples in the boat. They were filled with panic and fear. And they were struggling against the storm. Jesus was at total peace, resting, in fact, sleeping in the midst of the storm. The storm could not shake him out of his rest. The waves crashing over the bow of the boat and filling the boat with water could not wake him out of his sleep, out of his rest. Um, I remember a time camping with my brother in our backyard and uh, a rainstorm came up. It was an incredible rainstorm. Um, I didn't realize it until it was almost over. I woke up in, at some point in this rainstorm, and there was thunder and there was lightning, and my parents told me that it had been going on for an hour. And I didn't wake up through any of it, but I did wake up at one point, um, And there was water up to about here. (laughs) I'm glad I was laying on my back. My brother was sleeping beside me. I was on a foamy. Uh, My brother beside me on an air mattress was elevated above me. Um, I got up soaking wet and opened the door of the tent, and there was a big pool of water in our backyard. Uh, And our tent was right in the middle of that pool of water, and the rain was coming down. And so you can sleep through these things. (laughs) We'll come back to that in a minute, but first look at the disciples. In their panic, Jesus' disciples had forgotten about Jesus until the boat is on the brink of sinking. They've been busy struggling against this storm. They've been busy bailing. And now there's nothing more they can do. It's inevitable. The boat is going down, and their minds turn to Jesus. (laughs) Verse 24 again, they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. I've already come to the conclusion. Why is it so common for human nature to wait until all else fails before we turn to the Lord as a last resort? That should be our first course of action. But most people have a very weak prayer life in times of peace and comfort. And it's times in life that, or trials in life that motivate us to pray. And great trials tend to produce great prayers. And when we do turn to God in prayer over a crisis, uh, it is usually with a sense of panic. And often our attitude towards the Lord in that state of panic is critical. God, are you sleeping? (laughs) God wasn't sleeping. Jesus was sleeping, but God was fully alert. And I'm not making a dichotomy between God and Jesus. He was fully God and fully man. But during this 33-year period of his life on earth, he lived restricting and limiting himself to his humanity. 
Though he never ceased to be God, he never acted as God. He acted as a man. And an illustration, example to us. But God, are you sleeping? Why don't you do something? Don't you care about me? In fact, Mark chapter 4, verse 38, the parallel account tells us that some of Jesus' disciples, or at least one of them, had these words to say to Jesus when they woke him. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you ever pray to God like that? God, don't you care? Some won't even pray to God in a crisis because they are angry at him for allowing their circumstances. But why does God allow bad things to happen to his people? Why doesn't he always keep the storms of life away from his followers and instead bring them upon his enemies? We could understand it if this boat was full of unbelieving, blaspheming Pharisees. God might justly let the storm come upon them and let it go to the bottom of the sea. But why does it happen to Jesus' disciples? And to Jesus, he's in there too. Have you been praying for a safe, comfortable life, free from trouble, but you seem to have a life full of trouble? Do you pray for a miracle to deliver you from your trouble, but conditions are getting worse and worse for you? The water in the boat is getting deeper and deeper, and you sense that you're about to sink? Why does God do that? Why does God allow that? Do you know that sometimes God works a greater miracle when he sustains his people through the trial, through the trouble, than if he had spared them from ever experiencing the trouble? For example, for God to have let Moses' bush burn but not to be consumed by the fire is a greater miracle than for him to have prevented that bush from ever burning and experiencing the fire. God is being glorified in our trouble, and if we realize this, we will find peace in our hearts, and in the midst of a storm, we will be able to say, Lord, be glorified through this trial in my life. I'd like you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. There's a passage of scripture here that is encouraging, but at the same time very sobering in its message. Verse 5. Hebrews 12, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Get that? Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If you're going through chastening, if you're going through these trials, it's because you're a child of God, a son of God. If you're not going through these trials and this chastening, You're illegitimate. You are not a child of God. If you're carrying on comfortably through life with very little trouble, everything's working out for you, you got reason to be concerned. If you are without chastening, you are not a child of God. But if you are gold and silver, then God will put you into the furnace to purify you. The furnace is for the gold and the silver. The trials are for the children of God to make us better, to strengthen us. Jesus said in John 15, verse 2, Every branch that bears fruit, the Father prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
So brothers and sisters, our present trials in life, and we all, if you're a true child of God, have them. We, we sat around the breakfast table the other day, tried to think of an example from Bible or church history or our current experience of a godly man or woman, a person who God has used, who didn't go through trials, who didn't go through tribulation. And, um, only came up with one answer. One of the kids piped up, what about Boaz? But, <laughs> always wreck the illustration. You know? <laughs> but we don't know much about Boaz. And what we... But what we do know of the people of God, it is the norm for them to go through trials. The storm on the Sea of Galilee was our present training ground for more serious conflicts ahead. It was the disciples' training ground. Your storms that you're going through is God's training ground, preparing you for more significant storms ahead. Um... Don't you want to learn to weather the storms like Jesus rather than the disciples? Two people in the same circumstances, very different reaction, very different response. The storm in the Sea of Galilee was preparing Jesus' disciples to trust in the Lord and to rest in the confidence that in the days to come, when much greater storms of spiritual opposition and persecution would come against them, they could stand, they would trust, they would not be shaken. Like the parable of the seed that fell on shallow rocky ground, which sprang up but soon withered when the heat of the sun came upon it, representing those who grow excited about the Lord and the Christian faith. As long as everything is going well, they're fair-weather Christians. But as soon as trouble comes, their faith disappears, and so do they. Those whose faith will not endure the hardship of sickness, the hardship of financial loss, the hardship of other storms of life will never stand when faced with persecution or death for their faith. And Jesus Christ is preparing us through the storms of life to endure to the end, to be strong to the end, to be fruitful to the end, to be faithful to the end. In verse 24, they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Now, I wonder, I just wonder, what those 12 disciples really expected Jesus to do about that situation when they woke him and said, Master, we are perishing. I'm sure their expectations were far less than what they experienced when they called upon him in their trouble. Um, Maybe they just thought he would somehow keep that boat out, or maybe they thought he would just help them bail. (laughs) I don't know what their expectation was, but Jesus knew immediately what was going on when he woke up, and he knew immediately how to deal with the situation. Jesus spoke to the storm as if he were speaking to some morally responsible being, and he rebuked the wind and the waves. Now, as we said, storms on the Sea of Galilee to this day are normal, common, unpredictable, but frequent. But this storm was different. This storm was not normal. It seems to have been a demonic attack, and Jesus discerned that, and his assessment was accurate. Um, Should we expect all the storms in life to be subdued and silenced? No. But there are some that, yes... This was a double miracle. Instantly, the wind stopped blowing, and instantly the waves, which can often continue to swell on that sea for an hour or more after the storm, became calm. The laws of nature were created by God, and they described the way that God normally works. 
but they can be overruled by his command. Water will do whatever its creator tells it to do. Water will let people walk on it when commanded by the creator. Water will turn itself into wine when commanded to do so by the creator. And violent waves will not take their time to gradually settle down, but will instantly be as still as glass when commanded by the creator. God's word is different than people's word. God's word causes things to happen. Do we understand the power of God's word when spoken at his prompting? The word of God doesn't simply work on the hearts of people like our word to motivate them to act in response to the hearing of God's word. That's how our word works. Uh, We try to say things in a convincing way that will hopefully motivate, hopefully persuade people to listen to what we are asking and do what we want them to do. But God's word is infinitely greater. God's word actually has the power to make things happen, to cause inanimate things like wind and waves to instantly do what was spoken Remember right at the very beginning, God spoke, and the spoken word of God caused things to come into being. Can you imagine the scene? They're standing perhaps up to their knees in the water in their boat, where 12 men gaping with their mouths wide open, struggling to mentally process what they have just seen and experienced. The water is glass. There's not a a breath of wind. The only sound of water is what's sloshing around in the bottom of their boat as they're shifting around, looking at what's going on, what happened. Verse 25, But Jesus said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. Disciples at the last moment before they went down cried out to the Lord, and Jesus rebukes them gently by asking them, where is your faith? What were you trusting in before you finally called upon me? Was your faith in your own seamanship? Was your faith in your own skill at handling storms? You've done this before. You know what you're doing. You can do it again. Is that where your faith was? Where was your faith? And when you finally called upon me, why were you in such a state of panic? Don't you yet believe that I am the Son of God? You claim that you believe that. Don't you realize who has been right here with you in the same boat going through the same storm with you all along, don't you know who I am? I said we were going to cross over to the other side of the lake. Did you think that I would fail in my mission? There is no power in nature or in the spirit realm that can prevent the accomplishment of my word. Do you really think that the Father is going to let the Son of God drown in a storm and sink to the bottom of the sea before his mission is over? Jesus is in your boat. Jesus is in our boat. That fact alone is our security, not our skill at navigating life. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Our confidence is in the trustworthiness of the one who said that. We, the people of God, are the church of God that he promised to build, and he promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against his people. We need the faith of Paul who realized that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. God had a good reason for all that he allows us to go through in life. He allows it. He permits it. It is always for our good and always for the good of others and always for the glory of God. Now, knowing that, who would really 
in prayer like to give up God's good plan for us and instead insist on what seems better in our eyes and spare us from facing any trouble, God. If God's plan and God's purpose is to do what is the very best thing for you, and only God knows what is the very best for you, and to do what is most glorifying for him, which is where we find our greatest joy and pleasure, would we really want him to change that plan and give us something less than the best? Because your plan's a little uncomfortable, God. He uses the utmost wisdom in all that he does to do that which is for our good. Do we want him to change and arrange for us something unwise instead? I don't think so. So these are things we need to realize as we are in the storm and understand who is with us. He's promised to never leave us or forsake us. And instead of crying out against the wisdom of God and the loving nature of God and his perfect plan for us, let us trust his wisdom. Let us believe that he loves us in this. Let us trust that there is no better way than the way that he is leading us. Let us gladly accept the trials in our life because the Lord is in it with us. And what if the trial we are going through leads to death? What about that? What if God is going to let you sink to the bottom of the sea? Many Christians have died. (laughs) Where is your faith regarding death, child of God? What do you believe regarding death? Charles Spurgeon again wrote this. We feel a thousand deaths in fearing one. You feel, you experience a thousand deaths when you fear dying once. To die is nothing compared with fearing to die. All the agony of death lies in the fear of it. Death itself for the child of God is the end of all agony. Death is not the storm, but the silencing of the wind, the waves, and all fear. Through death, Christian souls enter into rest. But people are made wretched by their faithless fear of death. There's two kinds of death, and they both bring peace. They both bring rest. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's one kind of death. When we allow the flesh to be put to death, when we reckon that we have been crucified with Christ and he is now our life, we can experience what Jesus was experiencing in that boat, rest and peace through the storm. And then there's the physical death which too, for the child of God, is better than life. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Now this storm and this miracle were both intended to strengthen the disciples' confidence in the power of God's word and the security of his abiding presence. Without experiencing the storm, they could not have experienced the power of God over the storm. Uh, what would they have missed out? You know, that, that moment of gaping wonder and marvel when everything went silent and still, and they're standing knee-deep in the boat. They would have never experienced that moment of the awesome power of God if they hadn't first experienced the storm. That jaw-dropping experience would have been missed if they had not been absolutely overwhelmed to the point of near death by their struggle with the storm. If your Christian faith and experience has never caused you to marvel at God's work, there's something wrong, there's something missing from your faith. And these disciples were moved to ask the question, who is this 
man, who is this Jesus? Verse 25, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Who is this? He is the Son of God. He upholds the universe by the word of his power, according to Hebrews 1.3. In him, Jesus, all things hold together, according to Colossians 1.17. With a word, he commands the dead to rise and live. He rebukes a fever, and it must leave. He takes five loaves of bread and feeds 5,000 people. He speaks, and a fig tree withers. At his instruction, water turns into wine. At his command, the wind and the waves are instantly still. He is the creator of all things, and he is in control of all that he has created. Nature and supernature bow to his authority. But here is one of the most amazing things of all. Jesus, though he is the Son of God, is in this account that we have just read, living as a man, limiting himself to the limitations of a man who is fully trusting in the Holy Spirit of God to work through him and minister through him. He is the example to us of how we are intended to live the Christian life. We too can have such faith and confidence in God that we can remain in total peace and rest through the fiercest of life storms. And we too can discern when there is a demonic attack and can be prompted by the Spirit of God to rebuke the powers of hell and the forces of nature. Even Joshua in the Old Testament at the prompting of the Holy Spirit commanded the sun to stand still in the sky and it did for a whole day. That does not take away from the fact that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. But it was God working through a man. And we are going through all of the experiences of life that we are going through, and each and every one of those experiences is meant by God to conform us to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, to be like him in his character, to be like him in his ministry. Jesus is our example, and we are followers of this Christ this God-man. Is Jesus not in your boat? Do you lack confidence that Jesus is actually in your boat? There is no hope for you without Jesus in your boat. I invite you this morning to cry out to the Lord and invite him into your boat recognizing that when he comes in, he will take over. Do you agree to that? Are you willing? Maybe you're at that point in your life where you want him to take over. You are tired of the struggle. You are tired of life. You are tired of the failure. You want Jesus to come in and take over. Invite him. Maybe Jesus is in your boat. You know he's in your boat But you're struggling. There's no rest. You're fearing. There's no confidence. Cry out to the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Listen to what the Lord directs you. Let the Lord guide. Let him be Lord. Father, I thank you for your word. Oh, I thank you for the light that it gives the hope, encouragement. Lord, I thank you that you speak through your word. You minister into our hearts and our lives. Lord, there are needs here among us. Some of us need you in the boat. Others of us need to trust that you are in the boat and that you will never leave us. Others 
need confidence in your power and your ability over our circumstances. And we need faith and confidence that you are actually working through these things for our good. Lord, there's all kinds of needs that we have here today. But I thank you that your intention and your motivation is to conform each one of us to the likeness of Jesus Christ, to make us more like you. And so I ask, Lord God, that you would be very much in that process of shaping and conforming us, transforming us by the renewing of our minds this morning. I pray, Lord God, that you would cause us to heed your word, listen carefully to what you are saying, and to respond to it. Lord, I pray that all throughout this room, we would be responding individually to what you are saying to our hearts and to what it is you are wanting us to gain from this, to apply from this. Cause your word to bear fruit in our lives. Because it is the word of God, I can pray, cause things to happen in us that would shape us and mold us and conform us to your likeness. That we might know the peace of God in the midst of the storm. That we might know the power of God over the powers of hell. That we might know that confident assurance that gives meaning to all the circumstances and struggles of life, that there's purpose in this, there's reason in this, you are accomplishing something in this, Lord. I pray that you would fill our hearts with faith in you and cause us to not wait until the very last resort, but Lord, may we, right from the start of every day, be calling upon you, trusting in you, involving you in every aspect of our lives to the glory of God, to our good, and to the salvation of souls around us. In Jesus' name, we thank you for nourishing our spirits. We thank you for the confidence we have that this is true. And we thank you for the confidence that we have that it's not just history, but it is what you are speaking today and accomplishing and doing in our lives today. May we yield to that, agree with that, cooperate with you, I pray. And I ask it all in that awesome name of Jesus. Amen.